Exploitation. Yeah, that just that's just it goes without saying. I think that's going to come up a lot in this series because it always comes down to rich people being bored because they don't have to struggle like the rest of us and find joy in like the sunset or just like not having to work that day. You know, like they're sad, so they make people murder. It's just really wild to me the argument that. <laughs> You do not have to worry about surviving financially so you no longer enjoy life. That does not make sense to me because now you have time to do things that would allow you to enjoy life. Like, I don't understand why having a bunch of money makes you not enjoy the sunset anymore. You can't buy the sun. Like, why Why does money influence that? It just really seems really bizarre to me. Um, and I don't understand. Yeah, I feel you. I feel what you're saying. Like, I feel like it sends a message that, like, everyone's miserable humanity is trash and we all just sad uh, and it just like sends a message that, like there's no solution like that it's better to not be able to afford shit sorry cursing i just it just doesn't make sense to me i don't understand what the argument is supposed to be or why they no longer are able to enjoy things just because they have lots of money it's like uh, then just like be man that's yeah. what meditation is for. Yeah. Um, and self, like inner looking at yourself, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Figuring out who but you I are But I think it's also person. like you feel like you're better than them because like you wouldn't. You're not going to kill people for money, but it's because you have a lot of it. You don't know what it means to not. So um, and then there's also just like when you have that much money, you've you've been exploiting people anyway. So this doesn't seem like that big of a stretch. Like you clearly already yeah. don't care about people I guess in order like, to get to that state, that yeah. part like of they're wealth. They're so detached from what it is to be a person mm -hmm. at that point. Okay. I get it from that angle. I guess it's just more so it's like, is that what people think the goal is <laughs> to be that rich that you <laughs> that can do you that to only other find people? find joy in murder. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that's more so where I was like, I, there's a disconnect for me and I, I, don't, I don't get it. I feel like, but I guess that's, under the assumption that they were never at any point within a space where they felt they were just human. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. With, I yeah. guess, that lens, it is different. Yeah. And it's also interesting. I didn't have it in my part, but the elite in this are American. Yeah. White people. And they're like, I saw some articles about them getting like... <laughs> Just like harassed because their acting is pretty bad. But um, I argue that the writing for them was not great. And like they the way that they were recorded was weird, too. And I think that was intentional because there are times where like there's this like two characters who always say something after like one person and they would like it seemed like it was supposed to be a joke, but it didn't quite hit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it. I thought it was very interesting because I was like, it's it's meta because it's primarily American audiences who are watching and enjoying this show about like how sad and awful the conditions are in South Korea for people who don't have money. And we're like, ha ha ha, look at those ridiculous elite, rich elite and <laughs> jerks. Like, no, that's actually like what is here. <laughs> it's like, this is you. <laughs> like, that is you watching them. Um, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right, let's get, get into, into it. it a bit, yeah. <laughs> let me get, let me do, let me go. So, uh, we watched Squid Game, which I've been saying Squid Games until I was writing the script and I was like, same thing with Alice in Borderland. It's just Borderland. Yeah. It's not lands, but the game is Borderlands, so that's where my brain goes. Anyway, uh, what is Squid Game about? Hundreds of cash strapped players accept a strange invitation to compete in children's games. Fun. Inside, a tempting prize awaits with deadly high stakes. A survival game that has a whopping 45.6 billion won prize at stake, and it is directed by Huang Don Hyuk. Uh, yes. I didn't do the the currency for won, but it's a lot. And I know a lot of people looked it up and were like, how much is this? <laughs> sounds like a lot because they use like it's like so many more like when I first started reading or like watching um 
like K dramas and stuff, and they would like mention how much won. I was like, how much is that really? Because I don't know. It seems like a lot. And then it'd be like twenty bucks, but <laughs> but it's like twenty thousand won. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> a lot that's a lot you just got carrying around anyway uh i know that was just like a thing people had so uh murder games right that's what we're covering and that's what squid game is and people are going nuts for it and i totally understand murder games are fun uh there are people who see this as being one of the best shows about murder games i would say those people probably haven't seen anime but it's okay yeah (laughs) just because like there's a lot or just like hopefully this means they'll watch more um yeah you're definitely allowed to enjoy enjoy things but maybe watch more things before you say this is the best because it's great but i don't know we're yeah. going to be revisiting some things, so we'll see. Um, yeah. I am a huge fan of South Korean media, and I can't wait until I can figure out a way to wiggle in kingdom onto the ghouls. It's like True. zombies and classism. And just sign me up. <laughs> like, and it's also really amazing storytelling. Uh, and great zombies. Like, the lore is great. So um, I get genuinely excited uh, when we cover... Uh, critical media like by like Bong Joon-ho right yeah that is making statements but I also get really excited about k-dramas so (laughs) I'm very much uh Kariboo like I said um when I first saw the trailer on Netflix for Squid Game I was like what is this strange and playful but definitely murderous show like I was like this is like it's so bright and colorful but it's also very eerie and uncomfortable I like watched the whole trailer and then immediately put it on my list and I was like, I got to watch this. And then my younger sister was like, you really need to watch it. And she said it had more twists than a road in Tennessee, which I'm sure means something. Uh, (laughs) And so I binged it (laughs) so that I could talk to her about it. But um, I'm just a sucker for for murder games and series like series or films in general. Um, And for people who don't know what that kind of like subgenre (laughs) <laughs> film is it's essentially like a series of film uh in which normal folks sometimes children like in battle royale have to fight to the death for some reason uh a good deal of the characters in these shows and films fight simply to survive um there was a few sometimes it's like a so, psychological experiment there was like the one recently in america where they were like in a company And it was like, every hour you got to kill somebody or we're going to kill someone. So then they had to make the choice of who was going to die. So it's always like people are just trying to survive. And the the result in that is that you sometimes have to kill people or you got to get rid of the weakest link or what have you. Um, And uh, it like, yeah, it's just a matter of like someone has to die and it's not going to be me. <laughs> right. And that's yeah. usually why they end up killing. Um, there's going to be alliances made and then broken really dramatically. There's going to be really gory deaths and also really sad deaths. Cause of course you're going to fall and care for the characters, even though you know, they're going to die. Um, other murder games that director Hong Dong Hyuk could have been inspired by are battle Royale which features a bunch of school kids killing each other just to survive, um, which people say was inspired or had inspired Hunger Games. Okay. Uh, And I agree because it came first. (laughs) So Hunger Games could be very well uh, influenced by that. Um, And then uh, I, I recommend that if you like Hunger Games. It's way more gory and less, like, romance-driven, but it exists. And then also uh, there's uh, As the Gods Will by Takashi Miike, who we covered on our show with a special episode just about him. Um, And we had found the absurd film Happiness of the Katakuris. And uh, God's Will is very much like that in that it's it's absurd. It's kind of goofy. It also has children's. It's it's very close because it's children's games yeah. that are monstrosized, but it's more um, fantastical. Whereas this is like people doing it right, like, and it's kind of fantastical in the fact that like who is who's creating these games and how do they have this island that's secret whatever but in (laughs) in Mike's thing it's like it's silly it's very silly um and 
if you have like just take the time and watch the trailer i promise you will not be disappointed because it's super funny and i want to watch it now um we won't cover it because it's a little too similar to this um but people have been you know referencing all kinds of murder games and saying that the director um dung hyuk stole these ideas from the films or series uh but i mean murder game plots are free <laughs> There, there are a lot of them, and it's the thread is there, and I get it. But it, I mean, they're all going to be similar in some way, but they're they're their own thing. You yeah, know? no one has like owns the rights to murder game prop plot prompt. Yeah. Oh, oh my god, words. Um, and so <laughs> this is the first one we're going to talk about, but obviously not the last because there's going to be an entire series about murder games. So. Uh, we'll tell you all about them. So later, we'll in this month, we'll be covering Alice in Borderland, which is truly terrifying to me because you have to win by being smart yeah. and like figuring out these like puzzles under pressure. And there's like many of these like murder games that where the plot or plot is like logic base games and uh -huh. i just like tap out i'm like no <laughs> like i'm not gonna be able to solve this under pressure i am not like that bright yeah. <laughs> like it's not gonna like i get it if it's like me versus somebody and it's like you, you gotta fight to survive sure but uh i gotta solve this puzzle that's not happening. Mm -mm. <laughs> so uh, in an article on Variety titled Squid Game Director Not Hurrying to Capitalize on Global Success by Patrick Freider, uh, Director Huang said, I freely admit that I've had great inspiration from Japanese comics and animation over the years. When I started, I was in financial straits myself and spent much time in cafes reading comics, including Battle Royale and Liar Game. I came to wonder how I'd feel if I took part in the games myself, but I found the games too complex and for my own work, focused instead on using kids' games. So <laughs> that's where he kind of got this idea of like murderous kid games. Could also be he watched me care. All right. So thankfully, <laughs> we're met with childhood games warped into murderous challenges of wit, endurance, and sanity. And just like humanity as well. There's yeah. team efforts and if you're a good person or not. And when it comes to down to it, is it me or is it you? It's going to be me. Um, <laughs> kind of mentality, obviously. Yeah. So I appreciated that because I was like, I can play Red Light, Green Light. I don't know about tug of war. I guess if I learned the things they did, cool. But just like tug of war by myself, that's not happening. Uh, the the show starts out with uh, the sad and deplorable uh, Seon Ki Hun, who spends all of his money, which was in, originally intended to buy his daughter a birthday gift. Yeah. So right out the gift, right out the the gate here, uh, to get more money. <laughs> he's gambling. He's he's paying horses, doing horse gambling i never really understood those but uh i <laughs> don't know enough about horses to be like that one's gonna win uh but we see gihan at his lowest um and he's not really like a likely hero or protagonist like at all yeah um in in murder games the characters are often motivated motivated by the need to survive the games themselves uh but sometimes the motivation is money just flat out. Um, and that is the case with Squid Game. And this results in an incredibly heavy societal critique that Kat is going to go into in her section because it becomes more of just like, what would a person do to survive? And more of like, what would a person do for money? Which is a different conversation. Um, and so then it, it kind of turns it into a bit more of that, like, more than the typical rich elite are doing anything for, uh, or, or are bored narrative and more into um people will do anything for money kind of narrative and they're trying to like uh confirm that <laughs> or like feel better about themselves because they're like see these people are so low that they would do anything like including murdering their friends um and so it, it's like one thing if you just need to survive uh because people do anything to survive including killing other people um but when the motivation evolves out of simply surviving into cunning and strategy to inherit wealth no matter what it becomes a bit more sinister um yeah kind of like um 
what was it, the ready or not kind of thing, right? Like those rich elite people, uh, <laughs> they were also killing for money, right? Like yeah. <laughs> at that point, it's like any, literally anyone, it doesn't even matter if you don't have any money. Um, Huang said in that uh, variety interview as well, um, I wanted to write a story that was an allegory or fable about modern capitalist society, something that depicts an extreme competition, somewhat like the extreme competition of life. But I wanted it to use the kind of characters we've all met in real life. As a survival game, it is entertainment and human drama. The games are portrayed as extremely simple and easy to understand. That allows viewers to focus on the characters, rather than being distracted by trying to interpret the rules. Um, which is true, because I'd say, like, part of the fun in some of the murder games is, like, you're trying to be like, could I solve this? Could I figure it out? Yeah. Um, and in, like, Alice in Borderland, it's like, could I? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, but when you're, like, facing, <laughs> like, these are people we're caring about, and they're just kind of hopeless and sad anyway, it kind of changes what your whole thing is. So I'm going to dabble a little bit into capitalism and Squid Game, but not anywhere near what Kat is doing. I'm mostly just talking about um, why this show stands out from other murder games in its representation of it. Um, So we're going to enter Spoiler Town. Yes. (laughs) So uh, go watch it. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's you're gonna you're not gonna want to stop you want to get through it it's gonna be really hard but we're here for you so go watch it then come back so uh what set this show apart from the other murder games shows was for me the second episode said um in the second episode the characters find a way out in the rules that they've agreed to and that if the majority of players agree um to end the game uh, then it ends. And um, this is like after the surprising reveal that they're in murder games um, and not a fun game of red light, green light, uh, or in Korean, it was the hibiscus flowers bloomed. Uh, so everyone is like shaken and they watch people just be murdered in front of them, just shot yeah. in front of them. They almost were shot. Like you just barely survived. And then someone's like, you can leave uh, if everyone agrees or the most of you agree. So then the characters beg to be released and um, they, you know, explain they have families. Someone's like, I haven't named my baby yet. Maybe that's real. Maybe it's not. Um, and that they have this life outside of the game they want to return to. So they have this really intense vote where uh, they have to decide uh, if they want to stay um, and get the money from the people who, like, if they play and they win, the money is split up by, to the winners. Um, and if they all quit, they go back to their lives, whatever, but the money that was gained so far from the people who died will go to the families of the players that died. So they get nothing. Yeah. Right? Um, and what's more, the votes aren't anonymous. Uh, you have to walk in front of everyone and choose money or freedom. Um, and it sets the tone immediately. Uh, But what got to me the most in this whole section, like in in that whole episode, was just that they got out. (laughs) That uh, the majority, barely, voted to leave. And so everyone returns home. And that's where the true message behind the series comes through, because all the characters that we learn to care for are suffering. Every one of them has strong motivations for being in a murder game that could give them money like more money than they've ever imagined and could solve all of their problems. Yeah. And the fact that they have problems where these rich people don't. Um, So they're not just like money hungry people. They're desperate and they're dying. Like there are things actively in their life that are causing them harm. And if they don't have money, they're going to be dead anyway. Um, Gihan, who uh, is our main character, uh, he's super goofy. (laughs) Um, He's no one. He's a nothing. He's a gambling addict. He's a terrible father and son. Uh, He has a really good heart, but he's kind of (laughs) dull, like witted. (laughs) And uh, is just, I mean, he he just never caught a break and he just keeps doing it because he thinks that's the way it's a slippery slope. Um, And so he's just kind of living with that. Um, Then there's, uh, (laughs) I'm trying to find a good picture of him because people 
like hate on him. Uh, Cho Sung Woo, who's a childhood friend of Gihan, who made it uh, after getting into Seoul National University and becoming supposedly successful. Um, but he resorts to attempting to commit suicide because he can't keep up with the debts incurred from, uh, <laughs> funnily enough, similarly to Gihan, was spending money to make money. Right? Yeah. He just had more money to spend and he was doing it uh, white collar instead of this like blue collar way that Gian was doing. I did read somewhere that people missed that he was committing suicide in the bathtub, but he was like in a full suit. He was in the bathtub. There was like the, the thing over there. Like, Oh yeah. I didn't realize that's what was happening either until yeah. you just said it right now. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's yeah. Teaching. Um, yeah, I got it. I was like, Oh, he's so, this is so sad. <laughs> I was like, Oh no. I, I got that. He was like upset. Or that, like, he was, like, fine with being dead. But I didn't realize he was, in that moment, attempting to unalive himself. Uh, yeah, he was going to unalive himself. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 it's super sad. But it's also, like, he really didn't have any other things. It's it's a part of it is that he was out of money and there's debts, debts to be paid. But it's also a... a pride thing as well because he was seen as someone who made it his mom like is gloating about him all the time and if he fails like it means more than just like oh you ran out of money you're gonna go to jail kind of thing it's like you ruined everything like you ruined your whole reputation and what people think of you um which is a really it's a very big thing especially in south korea and that's something like you see even in parasite right like that can that that uh need to be respected um, yeah. Is super strong. Um, there's also um, Kong uh, Sebiok, who is uh, everyone's favorite character, who is a North Korean refugee who has lost her father. He died. Her mother is trapped in China, which is the route you have to go through to get out of North Korea. And her younger brother is in an orphanage waiting for her and their mother. So uh, she is trying hard. Um, I'm going to go over like translation things and things you might miss out if you're not familiar with certain Korean culture things. But it is to note that uh, Saibiyuk has a North Korean accent that she tries to mask when she's around other characters, um, which is like, if you don't know that, <laughs> you wouldn't understand like how, like, it's kind of like she's swapping so that she can fit in. Uh, and this yeah, adds code to switch like, her whole, yeah, um, adds her whole character for sure. Then there's Ali Abdul, who's everyone's other favorite character and best boy and everyone should have a crush on look at this cute face he's yeah cute. he's very cute um he's an immigrant with a new baby uh who needs money to protect his family so everyone is sad and broken they're perfect victims for murder games organized by the rich elite that's it yeah. uh so they get out and then they get back in and that was what got me was the fact that they like Everyone chose to, to leave, or the majority of them chose to leave, and then so many of them chose to come back. Like, there's yeah. a few of them that didn't, but it's, like, that, like, other games, other murder game shows or films, people are just dropped in there, and it's, like, this is your only choice. And if you could leave, then you would just go, right? This is, like, this is how important it is. Like, this is how desperate they are, that they return to a game they know will murder them. Like, that... Yeah. It's, it's absurd. And so I think like that in itself, just that one episode and just that turn totally changed the entire outlook of it for me because I was like, whoa, <laughs> like that's crazy. Um, let me get into this because now I'm like, I got a lot to say. <laughs> and even still, not as much as I wanted to say. Uh, the show is really fun and gory and it plays well with suspense. Um, in the tug of war episode, we're stressed and lured into this false sense of security by the success of our favorite characters. Because yeah. you put them all together, it seemed hopeless, and then it worked out, and it sets up the viewers to be as vulnerable as possible in the next episode with marbles, which means you're like on equal footing, the same ground as the characters, who were also just as vulnerable. Um, and so you're you're being led through these games. <laughs> you are also victim to whatever the game masters decide as a viewer. Um, and it's just like this beautiful system that really plays with our relentless desire to hope. Um, especially in American media, the good guy usually wins. So we feel like in the end, it's got to work out, right? <laughs> like our friends got to come to like 
they're gonna make it. Everyone is so nice and they, they, you know, saved each other a little bit. They're working it out. So this is, you know, gonna work out. But it is a murder game show, friends, so it's not. Uh, we can yeah. only have one winner. It's not explicitly stated, but you know there can only be one winner, which means everybody else has to die. Um, so all the people you love and care for are gonna die. Sorry. Um, I'm going to shift over a little bit, um, cause I want to talk about some other things, um, that are not specifically plot related, but integral to the understanding and appreciation of the impact of the series. And one, um, thought is like the fascination with Squid Game by South Koreans reminds me of people's misguided obsession with the Great Gatsby, um, where like people get all glamored and glitz to party Gatsby style and they completely miss the point. Um, yeah. Although sloppy. Uh, that's a commentary on upper class society and the problems with it. And people are like, we're going to party like we're rich. And I'm like, you're missing it. <laughs> and so like, it's kind of similar where like, it's very popular in American media. Cause like, you know, it's, it's another place that has that kind of problem. So we think that's great, but it's only popular in South Korea, because uh, it's popular in America, and they're being represented in America, so they like that. And so there's like everyone who's dressing up, um, like <laughs> Squid Game. It's like you're missing the point of what it is. Um, anyway, and <laughs> I'm gonna go into some stuff, uh, and whatever, call me a killjoy. I don't care. In an article on Algeria, Al, Al Jazeera, titled "Why Some Korean Women Are Boycotting Squid Game" by Ann Babe. Uh, they interview a Korean woman who was very disappointed in the series portrayal of women. Um, Hyunjin Min, a film studies major at Yonsei University in Seoul, in the article mentions how Squid Game shows the shameful side of Korean society, but the sense of pride is way bigger than the sense of embarrassment. And the more interest international audience expresses in Squid Games, uh, the more pride South Koreans feel. Like the movie Parasite before it and the song Gangnam Style before that, uh, neither of which were immediately smash hits in South Korea, according to Min, it is actually is actually this attention abroad that makes Squid Game so popular at home. Now given its pop culture uh, super status, uh, feminist boycotters say their voices seem to be especially unwelcome. Rather than be acknowledged, they say they are dismissed as killjoys who would rather reign on the national parade than simply be happy for their country's success. Yeah, I mean, because it's like, who's getting success from this? Mm -hmm. Like, who's benefiting from it ultimately being successful? Like, the pride is one element to it, but also it's like those problems still exist. The ones that have like that giant magnifying glass on them. It's like, that mm -hmm. is still very much <laughs> yeah. the, the people who are struggling right now within the country are being acknowledged for that actual struggle instead of just like, and like people are just enjoying this as like media. That's fun. Um, when it's actually like, no, but like there's horrible things happening societally Mm -hmm. that need to be addressed and it's not killjoy time it's yeah. it's literally like this is what reality is made in a little fun box for you yeah and you're just right over the head in terms of recognizing like how essential it is that those things need to change yeah um that's what i was saying that's like, my interpretation thing um when I, it's like even thinking of like parasite with like the spike in people who wanted to like eat ramyun and it's like, that's because, but you're, no, <laughs> like that's not the point of what this, what do you, okay, you're essentially just like the couple that were like, had their fantasy about being on the subway because that was like so, you know, exotic for them. Uh, by you, like, you know, desiring to eat this ramen, you're just like, ooh, like we can do it like them, you know, like it's still this otherism and it's still like, you're missing the whole point of the whole thing. It's well, like yeah, it's like commodification <laughs> when that shouldn't be the re result of the highlight. Yeah, it's like all the people who bought Clownfish after watching Finding Nemo and missing the point that, like, Finding Nemo didn't want to be in the fish tank. Yeah, <laughs> the so, like, don't film was, create like, them Nemos in, the in your house. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, okay, so, the whole thing, right? Um, so... I totally get where the persons like the, these groups are coming from. And, you know, I 
often feel that we at the ghouls next door are called killjoys when we discuss things that are uh like issues in otherwise popular films we've even gotten like comments that are like it's just a film it's like that's not what media is media literacy friend um and don't get me wrong i love this show and i really do want people to watch it and i want people to enjoy it um i had a lot of fun and that happens a lot with a lot of the programs that we watch where we'll have a good time, but we still have our media analysis glasses on and we, it would be wrong of us in our show not to critique some of the things because they're not perfect. Right. Um, and I would say the terrible use of femme presenting characters was not lost on me. Uh, yeah. even watching it. And, uh, many of the women characters, if not all of them were tools for male characters, either to give them some depth, improve their compassion, like with Gihan and Sebiok, like the fact that he was taking care of her or caring for her at all. Like that's the most he ever did for any character um, besides like the old man uh, or to bring their demise after being scorned with like Han uh, Minyo and uh, Jung deok He was like, yeah. that's a whole thing, <laughs> which we'll, we'll get into. Um, one of the examples in the uh, Al Jazeera, Jazeera article is about Minio, uh, who is an incredibly misunderstood character in the American audiences for sure, because sub- t- subtitles were off. Um, yeah. But also, if you don't understand just the culture, you're going to miss some of the things that, that really make her character interesting. Um, and uh, Juhi Judy Han, an assistant professor of gender studies at the University of California in Los Angeles, uh, said... It is important that the debate surrounding Minio extends beyond whether her representation is realistic to more broadly consider the question she raises about what sexual empowerment means and how that could actually look in real life. Um, It's one thing to say that Minio is sexualized, but it's another question and a complex question for feminists to think about what sexuality means for women who are put in those precarious situations. Um, At the crux of visibility, uh, the visibility discussion, then, Han says, is questioning the agency of the characters, the vantage point of the story, and our own tendency as viewers to value and empathize with certain narratives more than others. It's only when we start disrupting that that we can start to pay attention to the importance of the more marginalized characters. Minio is kind of a badass in her own way, but is she a feminist heroine? I'm not sure. I just wish someone like her could have been the main character. Um, and it makes sense to me. <laughs> like, I was like, that, like, there is a, a, she was so, like, people hate on her so bad. And it makes me mad. Because yeah. I'm like, everyone is trying to survive. And a lot of those men did way worse than she did. All she was was annoying. And like, yeah. anytime a woman is dubbed annoying, gets me up because I'm like I am annoying so uh, and I understand like the anger that these women have about being represented in such a way um and considering how popular popular the series has been in America and also thinking that this might be the only glimpse into Korean culture that Americans get and furthermore into Korean women it can be harmful like it just creates and then like confirm certain biases and, and misrepresentation about those women. Um, and if that's all you're getting, like this is the one that makes it out and people watch now they have, now this is what they think of you. Um, yeah. There's another quote. Uh, Lee, a 25 year old student living outside of the South Korean capital Seoul is part of the feminist group Hale, which means tsunami in Korean. Like Lee, some other members of Hale have joined the boycott of Squid Game in hopes that it will send a message to writer-director Don Hyuk Wang that women deserve better. For now, critical conversations have taken place on feminist forums as the boycotters say they avoided posting on water platforms for fear of harassment in a country where feminists routinely face online vitriol. They want Huang to, to treat women's stories with more sensitivity and complexity as he plans for season two. It's like, we get it. You'd, he probably didn't even know it was going to be this successful, and now it is. Um, yeah, so like take that responsibility and use it well. Like yeah, now that now you know now. <laughs> that yeah. it's this and it's bigger, intentionally seek out mm-hmm. making that a better situation. Yeah. Because like, yeah, you did it already. You can't undo it now. Like, but yeah. you can do better in the future. That's like kind of like 
the human experience in and of itself. You were crappy yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> but tomorrow Learn you can be less crappy or better. even arguably uncrappy. You could just do good things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you yeah. can work to completely unravel what you had done, right? Yeah. Like you can put in that work. And, and decent representation is not too much to ask for. Like they are not asking for everything to be shut down. They're just yeah. like, could we do better in, like considering the real harm that is happening for women in South Korea and that these groups are like addressing, um, creating media that reinforces or even creates those stereotypes about these women. It's, it's simply another form of harm. Yeah. You know? Um, and Huang has said he has no intention of a second season or he's not rushing to it, like in that variety article. Um, but I do hope that he hears what these women are saying, um, and puts a bit more work into the women, that he's creating in whatever it is that his next project is. Yeah. Whatever it is. So my last, I'm getting there. <laughs> my last little bit. And then we're, and then I'm going to pass it over is about language and culture and mistranslations for American audiences, because you might have watched a different squid game than a Korean audience or someone who knows a little bit about Korean. Right. Um, so as mentioned Beth in a million times already, I'm a Karibu. And so I indulge in a lot of Korean media, whether that's manwas, uh, K-dramas, K-pop, k and films, series, whatever. <laughs> like all of it, all the time. Uh, and so in all that, I have become familiar with some of the cultural things, like, because I'm just very interested in that. I don't know any of those things, right? Um, and it, it is very different from things that we have or do or say in America. So for example, in Korea, there are words that you give to your friends that are akin to family. Um, and they tend to be specifically related to age differences and how close you are to each other. Um, and there's a lot of like, this, uh, this also happens in like Japan. Um, and I'm sure in other, just like America just don't got it. But there's a lot around like being polite. And there's like, you are polite with people. And then when you get closer to them, you might speak a little more casually. And it's just like, it's it's way more important over there than it is here. People just talk to each other like trash all the time. So, so that was always very interesting to me. And in the, in the show, there's a lot of instances of like, if you don't understand the culture or those words and the importance of them, then you might miss some of the more profound parts of, of those relationships. So in one of the most heartbreaking or the most, um, episodes, uh, our best boy, Ali, um, sweet, sweet Ali Abdul, is betrayed by the villainous Sang Woo. Um, super sad. We all saw it coming, but it's still very sad. <laughs> or at least I saw it coming. I was like, there's no way. He's too pure. Um, but the scene is even more heartbreaking when you learn that Sang Woo asked that Ali call him Hyung. And Hyung is what a younger man would call an older man affectionately. It's like big brother. Mm. Um, and in the series, um, I rec like, it's, I think they, he calls him like bro or like brother, but you don't understand like how important that word is. But also on the other side is what he had been calling Song Wu before that. And so in the subtitles, they mistranslated, uh, I'm going to say all these words wrong because I do not speak Korean. I'm sorry. But Shang Jung Nim, uh, they changed it to sir instead of boss. Um, mm. but if you understood that he was saying boss and you understood what that word meant, you would one, understand that Ali is pure, but he's also foreign. So he's using a far too formal and inappropriate term. Like he, he's, he doesn't quite under like he's using the wrong one. Um, but it's also incredibly formal and like boss. Right. And he also yeah. bows like really far. <laughs> like there's a lot of like, he's trying to be over polite to this man that he respects Two, in this change, you understand that the relationship jumps leaps and bounds from boss to brother, right? Like from yeah. you are like above me and this like uh, person that I respect and, you know, I'll do whatever you want to, we are equals. Yeah. Um, and we're family. We are friends. We're family, right? Like you mean something to me. And for that to happen right before the betrayal is like, oh, but you're just like, oh, we call them bro, whatever. Ah, so the depth and meaning for that word on someone like Ali, who is a foreigner and the sweetest boy that has ever lived, uh, makes it even harder to watch. Um, 
and and we kind of lose that in in the mistranslations or just like not knowing about the culture. Another instance of the familial names uh, being misused in subtitles was with Minyo, who continually gets a bad rap when it comes to subtitles in the show. Um, but she calls the mobster um, Jang Deok Su Opa. Uh, and this is a term used by younger women for older men. It's usually affectionately and also kind of brotherly, but could be like, if you have an older boyfriend, like you might call uh -huh. him Opa. Um, but it also could just be a friend, right? Um, and this is <laughs> in it, uh, she calls him that and they changed her subtitle to babe instead of like what it is. Um, oh, for mine, it was old man. Old man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then it changed to babe as it went. It was old man okay. first. Old man and then, and and then, then it babe. translated later to babe. So weird. Babe, I, babe, I kind of understand because it's like, a, it's the right affection, but old man is the right, like di direct translation, I guess you would say. So yeah, I get, I kind of get it. So, um, it, when it's with, when it was babe, it was confusing because Deoxu asks her, how old are you? Because she's clearly an older woman and yeah. it was used by younger girls and used affectionately. So it's like her, this is like her attempt to garner sympathy and she wants to see, be seen as cute and for them to want to protect her and to care yeah. for her. And so she's like, Pah. like, it's like this, like, like, oh, you're my, you know, like, oh, I love you. Like this kind of. Um, like, don't you think I'm adorable kind of thing? And, and so it's like her vulnerability in that. And if she's just like saying, babe, it just kind of seems flirtatious. And that's not quite like, she is flirtatious in a lot of ways, but it's not quite the desperation of like, see me as someone you want to protect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, <laughs> this woman really got to me and everyone's hating on her. Uh, but She's trying to survive, and it's a murder game, and I'd be annoying too. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you don't think I'm going to be trying to be everyone's friend and loud and be like, and she also has to work so hard for people to see the value in her because they immediately already have assumptions about who she is. Yeah. And so um, there's also this TikToker who uh, went in over some of the issues she did on TikTok, and they also did it on Twitter. Uh, and their name is Young Me, Mayor, and they said, if you don't understand Korean, you didn't really watch the same show. Translation was so bad, the dialogue was written so well, and zero of it was preserved. The reason this happens is because translation work is not respected and also the sheer volume of content. Translators are underpaid and overworked, and it's not their fault. It's the fault of producers who don't appreciate the art. Um, feel it. I feel it. Um, Young Me has also done that work before so they understood um and some of the the translation issues were from Minio's character and if they were translated properly they may have given American audiences a better more informed view of her and why she was the way she was yeah. um for example uh at one point the subtitles read I'm not a genius but I can work it out whereas the actual Korean was I'm very smart I just didn't get a chance to study and that's important because it's the entire purpose of the character and represents a trope of Korean culture in that like you know she's she's street smart instead of being book smart right yeah um and she never got the opportunity to grow to be book smart and so she's intelligent and she's conniving and cunning. Um, and had she been given the same opportunities as, say, Song Lu and went to the Seoul National University, maybe yeah. she wouldn't even be in the Squid Game at all because <laughs> she's just that smart. She just lower class and didn't get that. So opportunity. yeah, didn't get the opportunities. You don't. You can't afford like lessons. You probably went to a poor school. Like we've covered this before. It's just like you're stuck in this world. Um, another example I found interesting was in that same heartbreaking episode with the marbles. Um, you all know which one I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and uh, Onyam uh, is the old man. Yeah. That you love uh, the terminal ill and he's uh, rambunctious and he calls his teammate and friend gi -hun, you know him uh, the he calls him his gung -bu, and I, I'm sorry if I say it wrong I can't speak Korean um, and he explains in 
like when he calls him that, that this is like the name you gave a friend when you, and you would share your marbles and like everything was each other's. Um, and he explains that with this name, it means there's no yours or mine. Uh, and that there's no, he also says like in Korean that there's no debt between Gung Boo. Like we're equal. We don't owe each other anything, which is different from like, there's no yours or mine. It's, it's that we're not indebted, which is like a big deal. Um, in a, murder game where debt is the crux of everything um and in the translations these lines are either mistranslated or omitted completely they just didn't even say them um but with all that being said <laughs> squid game is fun and heartbreaking you will laugh and you will cry and you'll do that a bunch of times until you just you're honestly just crying at the end like you, and then you just yeah. don't stop crying after anymore. the marble episode i cried until the end of the show yeah. And like in a very unexpected way uh -huh. because of what we find out at the end. Like yeah. the Marble episode, you know, I love like this sounds weird to say because I don't mean it how it's. Yeah. I love old men. Yeah. Innocent. Just ba like they're not babies, but like they are older and they need you to know. be protected. And then to have that be what it was, <laughs> the level of upset that I still am. Mm -hmm. Just, like, daily I'll think about it and just be like, <sighs> why? Why did they do that to me? Why? Yeah. Um, yeah. So sad. You just start crying. You're just crying for forever. Um, but I would say, like, believe the hype. Like, I think, like, if you can stomach it because it can get really rush, like, harsh, um, give it a watch if you're into something like this. Because like, it is, it does stand out from the other ones. Um just make sure your subtitles are set to English subtitles and not English CC, the closed captioning, which translates the dub instead of translating the sub. So oh. that's why they're like super off. Um, oh, also fun fan theory that my sister and some other fans came up with was that if Gihan had chosen the pinkish red square in the slap game in the beginning, then... Yes. Uh, with a gung yu, uh, then maybe he would have been one of the pink folks who have yep. run the game. Uh, yeah, that checks out for me. Because they both seem like they were being uh, subjugated in some way. Like yes. they were not on uh, equal playing ground as the the guy with the fancy room and the mask. Uh, yeah, that wears all black. But uh, he was also like a pawn too. Yeah, he's like he's trying. Like he, he was had won previous games, yeah. and I think because of that, had been like entered into this kind of you have to be in charge because you mm -hmm. you won one of the first games yeah but i think there i mean that's why i'm like there's not enough time because there's a whole other ex like discussion to be had about the pink people because they were also victims like they're also struggling and it's like a social experiment because it reminded me of the stanford prison experiment where you like give the prisoners some of them are in charge and the other ones are the prisoners and then it became this whole thing because they were abusing their power because you do that so like you could see because sometimes they were murdered too and they obviously had this like hierarchy and the yeah. different shapes mean things like if there were a second season I would want it to be about the pink ones so you can see that they were also there's a whole thing and that's why I was like I think there's so much more depth to this than people are just giving like Brushing yeah. it off and being like, whatever, it's a, it's a murder show. Well, well, yeah. And I get it, but you're wrong. <laughs> it is yeah. a critical piece of media. And I could talk about it forever, but I'm I'm significantly out of time and eight into a cat's time. And this is going to be a very long episode and I apologize. So, Kat, it's your turn. Yeah. I also think there's something that really can be said about the fact that um, when they get to the scene where the police officer who is mm -hmm. like invading the space to like find his brother um, gets to that part where you have the tanks that are meant for people to like leave in an emergency, but they're not meant for the pink people. Mm -hmm. They are meant for like the elite guests yeah. and the off chance that something goes wrong. Not at all for mm -hmm. the staff who are working for them. And I feel like that sent a very clear message that they were not there to be protected by well, the even shot one of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that, that as that well. Boy, he was a child. Yes. And I, when I saw him, I was like, 
is this their military service? Like, he somehow got into this or whatever? Like, that was where my mind went, but then it became clear that it's, like... That's not it, yeah. Yeah, but they're also, like, skeevy people, because they were, like, trying to sell organs, and they were also doing stuff to bodies they shouldn't be doing. Like, they're clearly not, like, one... Like, they're not just, you know, the elite at all. They yeah, they're not uh, without these situations that uh, societally have put them in this position. Mm-hmm. Um 